evening, Madam President. Uh, nice to join you on the final night of session. It looks like it is uh, going on a little after 6.30 or so, so we have just a few hours left. And I'll say welcome back to those folks who have been watching the, the saga of the bill that we've been debating for many, many hours, I think since around noon today, uh, which is Senate Bill 998, which I'll remind folks listening uh, began as a non-controversial bill uh, entitled an act establishing a tax abatement for certain conservation easements. It's a bill that uh, uh, passed out of this chamber and uh, went to the House and ultimately has come back to us, uh, not resembling the bill that, that left here. It now contains around 40 new sections, um, which I guess I would put into two different categories. One of them uh, it would be the uh, effort to establish something called the Fair Share Plan in Connecticut, uh, which is loosely um, described as something that will help uh, provide affordable housing in the state. I don't think that will be the end result of that policy, and we'll certainly have that conversation. Uh, but the other part of this bill is focused really on the relationship between landlords and tenants, and I think uh, anyone who looks at this bill is going to see that it's pretty heavy-handed and certainly one-sided in the direction of the tenant versus the landlord. Um, my colleagues that have spoken uh, before uh, earlier today uh, have done a tremendous job in discussing the fair share sections of the bill and uh, pointing out the significant flaws therein. And uh, I certainly have my own commentary to add to that, but I don't want this debate to go by without addressing the other part of this bill, which are the concerns over the uh, housing sections relating to landlords and tenants. And uh, effectively, that's the start of the new sections of the bill anyway. Um, I also just want to say that uh, it's unfortunate that we are here on the last day of session debating such a controversial item. You know, we had the uh, fair share bill in the committee it was House Bill 6633. We had a significant debate there in the, in the committee process. And I think, sadly, that bill left the committee on a party line vote. Uh, an indication, really, that we did not have agreement about what we were going to do in the state about providing affordable housing. And the other um, items that are in this bill, many of them appeared in a smattering. I always wanted to say smattering on the Senate floor. Madam President, now I have accomplished that goal. Uh, a smattering of bills that passed out of the uh, committee at the time. And this bill that's before us is just a container, you know, that was used, a vehicle, a vessel, uh, that, uh, you know, was another suitable bill, I guess, the majority felt uh, was appropriate to tack on all of these items uh, through uh, various uh, backroom negotiations. Uh, the sad part is I wasn't part of any of those negotiations. I'm the ranking senator on the Housing Committee, and I have strong opinions, and I've expressed those opinions throughout the committee process and beyond, and I had assurances from both the House and Senate chairs of that committee that we would have ongoing discussions and negotiations about these bills going forward to try and come up with something that we could all find agreement with. And I know since I spend nearly every day in this building during the month of uh, May and uh, the early part of June, uh, that there have been negotiations. Day after day, I see the people involved. In fact, I pass them sometimes in the hallway while they're negotiating the language in the bill that's before us, and yet it's not invited to any of those discussions. I represent 1 36th of the people of this state and people who will all be impacted by the bill that we are about to pass, just like every other bill that goes through this chamber. So it's not surprising that the final product doesn't appear to be something that I can be supportive of. And that's too bad, because there are some elements of this bill which, given the opportunity to negotiate and find a resolution, we might have come to common ground. But I don't believe that was ever the goal. The goal was simply to find a final product that could be passed. Irregardless of support from the minority party, I don't know how many uh, 
folks passed, uh, voted for this bill in the House from the minority. I, I wish I looked that up, but I don't think there were uh, too many, if any at all. And I doubt there will be uh, any votes from the minority upstairs, and that's just not a way to do this. Uh, the bill passed the House by a narrow margin with even members of the majority party voting no. And I would bet that had more people had an opportunity to look at the language in this bill and truly understand the impact of the fair share portions of this bill, many, many lawmakers in the Democrat majority would have also voted no. But again, this process sometimes boils down to um, jamming bills through uh, both chambers quickly on the final few days with a sense of urgency. But that's where I come in, Madam President. I am the backstop against urgency because I at least have, while I don't have enough votes sometimes to overcome the majority's will and desire on certain policy items, I do have the ability to get up and speak about it. And so that's what I plan to do here today. So I would like to start right at the beginning of the amendment and the new sections of the bill, which is section 501. And this section, my notes say that it increases civil penalties against an owner of a rental property for violations of municipal rules relating to the maintenance of safe and sanitary housing. Um, that's something I think we can all agree on. We know that we have a problem in this state with certain uh, housing providers that do not do a thorough enough job maintaining their properties. And I expressed a willingness throughout the entire committee process to find common ground on ways to approach this subject, to come up with a solution that says we have to find a way to get these bad landlords. In fact, there was so much conversation, I remember from the various public hearings about bad actors, bad actors. Well, there probably are some. But there are plenty of good actors too. And the sad part of what's going to happen with this bill is that many good people are gonna get caught up in this. And the unfortunate part about that is that we will not just be getting the bad actors. In fact, I suspect they will find ways around some of these things. But what we will be doing is we will be um, um, en engaging and, 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 and um, uh, bringing into this uh, conversation people that otherwise are doing the right thing. And I also think that ultimately the tenants in these uh, supposed uh, properties, good and bad, may be the ones that suffer the most. And that's, that's the part that bothers me more than anything, Madam President, because I want to see um, commerce uh, in Connecticut um, experiencing as much freedom as possible in order to provide for the thing that is the stated goal of this bill and many others like it, which is to increase the um, availability and affordability of housing in the state of Connecticut. But I know the only thing that can do that is an environment that is conducive to that happening. And that environment involves less government regulation on housing providers. That doesn't mean that we want people to have poorly uh, managed buildings and uh, you know, difficult uh, circumstances or uh, unsafe or unsanitary living conditions. Quite the contrary. What we want is a situation where landlords are here because they want to be here and they're willing to compete with each other for more tenants. They're f if we put them in a situation where they're fighting for tenants, that is going to force uh, them to reduce prices. That's going to force them to improve the quality of their uh, units. It's going to entice them to make more um, satisfactory and, and beneficial terms to tenants. That's how a marketplace works. But as so often happens in Connecticut, in our state legislature, we abandon the notion that the market can fix itself because there are people out there that want to participate in a marketplace. And instead, we invoke government. Government's the answer for everything around here. We're going to use government. We're going to set up a system of rules. We're going to decide what fair is. When I first heard the term fair share housing bill, I asked myself whether this was something that was in an Ayn Rand novel. And in fact, it very well could be, because that's what it reads like. It's government run amok. It's government uh, using its power to interfere in a place where it does not belong. 
and it does not have the power to correct the problem. The problem is a lack of affordable housing created by the government's overregulation of an industry, preventing people from investing in it, and creating a housing uh, supply that matches the demand. In any other marketplace where there is demand, someone creates a supply because there's money to be made. That's not happening here to the degree we need it to, and why is that? It's because the ability to make the uh, supply is uh, being uh, limited by the government's interference. That's what's going on. So if we are truly, truly interested in fixing the affordable housing problem in Connecticut, we don't pass bills like this, which send a terrible message. It says, you want to be a landlord in Connecticut? We're going to make the bill um, that we're passing today so onerous to you that you might contemplate whether or not you even want to be in the business. We're going to tell future landlords that Connecticut is not the place to be a landlord. How can anyone in their right mind say that we're trying to promote affordable housing while they're at the same time in the same bill making policies, making it harder to be a housing provider? It's not just illogical, it's immoral. And it sets up an excuse, and we've seen this over and over again in other industries. The healthcare industry, the government, in states across the country and the federal government, has entangled itself in the healthcare industry in so many ways that drive up costs and limit access. And then they come along on their white horse of government and say, we're here to save you, we will fix it. We will regulate it into infinity and we will make sure. But from where I sit, the healthcare industry hasn't been fixed. We have just as many people uninsured today as we did before the Affordable Care Act. We do have a substantial increase of people that are on dependence from the government now. Back in 2011, when I was first elected, coincidentally with Governor Malloy, the Medicaid program in the state had about 150,000 people on it. Today, it's over a million. That's what the Affordable Care Act created. It didn't get people into a voluntary insurance product. It's, it just funneled them into state assistance. It's not a solution because that state assistance costs money, which is a drain on everyone else's productivity. And that drain on their productivity slows down economic opportunity. And that slowdown of economic opportunity means there's a slowdown of job opportunities. And consequently, Connecticut makes the list over and over again for hostile to business, last place people want to move to, et cetera, et cetera. And it drives me crazy because I love this state. This is my home. I want Connecticut to be as um, brilliant and amazing as it has been my entire life growing up. I said the other night, talking about the budget, that I want to make sure that the people that are growing up now have the same opportunity in life that I have had. And everything I do in this building is all about making sure that I ensure that opportunity for them. But it's so hard. And this bill makes it hard to. I'm tempted to continue a rant, but I think I should get to the, the meat of the bill because one frustration I have in this place is that I hear speeches all day long from here and from my colleagues who I do not blame for doing so, but it's rare that we actually get into the policy in the bill. There's a lot of speeches about feelings and titles of bills, but not a lot about what the policy on each page actually accomplishes. And I like to do that because I think that is where we find the real answers to what's going on. So, uh, Madam President, I'm gonna start right on section 501, which is the first section of the amendment. And this amendment uh, is about uh, increasing civil penalties, again, as I said, for property owners uh, relating to the maintenance of safe and sanitary housing to $2,000, and there is a process for appeals and so forth, but I do have a couple of questions. Through you, Madam President, uh, in the uh, section 7AI, which is the very first section that's before us, there's underlying language showing that this is new policy. 
Uh, I'm curious, where in here is the opportunity for due process? Does the landlord have the opportunity to uh, stand up and say um, there is a reason why they should not be assessed the penalty uh, that uh, is being charged to them for a failure to uh, meet the requirements of this section? Through you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Moore. Good evening, Madam President. Madam President, and the following line, it says that um, pursuant to this subparagraph shall have a right to appeal to the legislative body of the municipality or the board of selectmen in a municipality where the legislative body is a town meeting upon the grounds that such violation was proximately caused by a tenant's reckless or willful act. Through you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator. Senator Sampson. Thank you, Madam President. I appreciate that, and I'm aware that language is in the bill. But my concern is that that language seems rather limiting to me. We are suggesting that if some uh, housing provider is being charged with a violation, that they have due process in this specific circumstance only, that they can uh, go to the Board of Selectmen in a municipality and I don't know that there is a mechanism in the bill for this appeal process, but that's neither here nor there. But it says that they are only able to do so upon the grounds that such violation was proximately caused by a tenant's reckless or willful act. Let me ask a question uh, through you, Madam President. What if the damage to the property was caused by the weather, for example, and the landlord not even being aware of it was being charged? Would they have the ability to appeal and say, there was a storm. I had no idea that uh, you know the gutter was ripped off the house and, and led to a violation through you. Thank you, Senator Moore. Thank you, Madam President. I would uh, uh, believe that if it was outside the house and it was due to weather, that the tenant would be able to explain that and they would be able to see that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Senator Sampson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. I appreciate the answer. Unfortunately, the answer doesn't have anything to do with the bill. This is not an issue between the landlord and tenant. We have taken the tenant out of the equation. This is an issue between the town and the landlord. Apparently, what happens is a tenant will complain to the town and say, hey, the gutter's ripped off my house. The town comes out there. They assess the landlord. Now, if the tenant might have contacted the landlord first, the landlord might have said, I'm going to come out there and fix it. I'll be there on Saturday morning, and I'll have a crew of guys, and we'll get it sorted out for you. But once the um, violation is assessed, is there a mechanism in this bill for the landlord to uh, receive due process to argue that the violation should not be assessed because it's for something they were not aware of, it was caused by something other than the willful or reckless act of a tenant through you. Senator Moore. Through you, Madam President. I don't see anything pertaining to that. Thank you. Senator Sampson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam President. In fact, the reason why we don't see it is because it's not there. It's a glaring omission in my mind. It is a limitation on the ability of a landlord to be able to protect themselves. And I understand that you know, this section was written uh, with an attempt at fairness. Um, and if it had been written better, I would actually agree with this section. I have no problem with uh, charging penalties and fines on negligent property owners. That should happen. They should be held to a high standard in Connecticut. But the fact of the matter is that the timeline is not laid out on how this process works or is there a mechanism for a landlord who ends up with a problem for something other than the tenant's reckless or willful act? Maybe the tenant did something that wasn't reckless or willful but led to the condition. Maybe the um, weather did it, as we mentioned. Maybe there was vandalism that led to the problem. Maybe the city shut off the water for the town. Maybe there was a problem with a neighboring unit that caused this situation. The list of maybes is endless, is my point. There are so many things that could actually end up causing a problem with a property that ultimately a landlord is going to be uh, find themselves being fined for. I will confirm uh, through uh, 
uh, you, Madam President, that uh, just for legislative intent, that there is something in here that says that if there are multiple violations uh, that are discovered on one day, they will still be treated as one violation. So there's no danger of someone being charged 2,000 times 20 items, for example, through you, Madam President. Senator Moore. Uh, Madam President, could I have the opponent uh, of repeat course. the question? We will stand at ease. I'm sorry. Re repeat the question, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question? Even I couldn't hear it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Madam President. I've never been uh, accused of being too soft with the microphone, but um, I will repeat the question, and that is just for legislative intent. I'd like to confirm that if a um, multiple violation situation occurs, someone comes out and they discover there is 20 violations, that uh, the landlord is still only going to be assessed for one violation in that circumstance of 2,000. They won't be charged 2,000 times 20 times. That uh, is correct. I'm sorry. Uh, Senator Moore. Through you, I, you are correct, sir. Senator Sampson. Thank you very much. And that's an important section. And maybe that's even too lenient. And my goal here is not to um, pick the side of the landlord or the tenant in this situation. What I want is a uh, policy that is fair and makes sense and takes into consideration all of the potential circumstances. And sadly, we can't do that sometimes. We can't plan ahead uh, to know exactly what's going on. So we should limit ourselves. We should limit ourselves in the policy that we make to the things that we actually can identify and control. But as so happens, the government is insatiable in what it wants to control. It just can't get enough. And this is another situation where it feels like the government has to be involved in the situation. The government need not be involved in this situation. Landlords and tenants have their own agreements. They have private contracts. And in that contract, it's very clear what the terms are. The terms will state that the tenant has to pay rent on a certain day, and if they're late, there's a certain penalty, and if they fail to do this or that, that's a breach of the contract, and the landlord has, uh, agrees to provide the housing in a safe and sanitary way, and they have to fulfill their obligations too, and if there's a problem with the property, they gotta come out and they gotta fix it. It's all in the contract. It's all right there, and there's a mechanism in our law already to resolve an issue if it arises. This may be well-intentioned because we have folks that are concerned because they're uh, units in their building are not being taken care of. But they should be using the mechanism that exists in law already. Or we should simply be empowering these municipalities to be able to actually function properly and engage with housing providers and tenants in a mechanism that resolves the situation. But what we have here is a policy that is poorly written that doesn't leave due process for the landlord in the case of a thousand maybes. I mentioned weather, I mentioned vandals, I mentioned the neighbor. I mean, we could go on and on. One of the things that can happen is that the tenant themselves refuses to let the landlord in to fix the property. This was testimony we heard over and over and over again from housing providers. They say, yeah, you know, my ten tenant's complaining, but at the same time, they won't let me in the house. And we have already written other laws, Madam President, that... Uh, are very clear about restricting the access of the property owner in cases like that. So let me just ask for the record, Madam President, is there a situation? Will there be an opportunity for due process? Will there be an opportunity for the uh, housing provider to um, um, act, argue or, or uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Appeal uh, to the town in a case where the tenant is refusing the landlord access to make the appropriate repair. Is that covered in this section of the bill? Through you. Senator Moore. Through you, Madam President, if the person were to get a citation, they would be able to come in. But I also want to, if I may, go back to this existing law right now that the tenants can uh, uh, require a municipality to notify individuals of their right to contest the citation before a hearing officer whose decision can be appealed in the Superior Court. Through you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Sampson. 
Well, thank you, uh, Madam President. I appreciate that answer. Um, I don't, this appears to be the, uh, the section in that statute um, that is being repealed and replaced with this language. And maybe I'm, I'm not reading it correctly, but it looks like we are now limiting this circumstance only to uh, appeal in a case where such violation was proximately caused by a tenant's reckless or willful act. And I, as a result of that failure to provide for a due process situation in a case where the tenant is actually refusing access to the landlord, I have uh, drafted an amendment to resolve that issue. So through you, Madam President, I would like to call amendment LCO 9920. I ask that the clerk call this amendment and I be granted leave of the chamber to summarize. Mr. Clerk. LCO number 9920, Senate Amendment F. And uh, Senator Sampson. Uh, thank you, Madam President. This is a uh, simple amendment. It simply um, strikes and replaces section 501, which is the first section of the amendment, and changes the operative language so it now will include this sentence, which is, or the owner of such rental property was prevented from repairing any condition which caused such violation by any, ten any tenant of such rental property. It's a no-brainer amendment. There's really no reason to say no. I mean, I think we would all agree that we cannot hold a landlord accountable for a repair if the ten tenant is preventing them from making it. And if you agree with that statement, you vote yes for the amendment. If you think somehow that the landlords should be held accountable, even if they are being restricted from access to doing so, then I suppose you vote no, vote no but I don't see how that makes sense. Through you, Madam uh, President, I urge a, uh, I move adoption. I'd like a roll call vote. Thank you. The question is on adoption. We will have a roll call vote. Will you remark on the amendment, Senator Moore? Thank you, Madam President. I reject the amendment and ask my colleagues to vote no. Thank you, Senator. Will you remark further on the amendment? Will you remark further on the amendment? If not, I will open the voting machine. Mr. Clerk. Media roll call vote has been ordered in the Senate. We're voting on Senate Amendment F of Senate Bill number 998, an act establishing a tax abatement for certain conservation easements. An immediate roll call vote has been ordered in the Senate. This is Senate Amendment F. Of Senate Bill number 998, an immediate roll call vote in the Senate.
all the senators voted. The machine. Have all the senators voted? I do think that all the senators voted. The machine is locked. Mr. Clerk, give us the tally. Senate Amendment F, Senate Bill 998, total number voting 36, total voting 812, total voting 824. Absent not voting zero. Thank you. Amendment fails. Senator Sampson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. I'm disappointed the amendment failed. It appeared to fail on a party line vote with all Republicans voting in favor of the amendment and all Democrats voting opposed. Uh, to me, that was a straightforward situation where we simply were going to add a condition that says that we cannot hold a property owner responsible for a situation where the tenant is preventing them access. Um, but that's neither here nor there. I'm going to move on to section 502. Uh, again, there are 40 sections, 501 through 540. I'm going to uh, begin the discussion on section 502, which has to do with the uh, tenant's ability to walk through a property prior to uh, a rental. And furthermore, it creates the requirement for the Commissioner of Housing to prepare a standardized pre-occupancy walkthrough checklist. And I do have a few concerns about this section. Um, and it makes me wonder because I, I look at this and it, I ask myself whether the folks that drafted this section or I, I don't want to hold the LCO attorneys uh, accountable, but I mean the people that came up with this process, whether they have any real knowledge of how this usually goes in the real world. Because I, I've been in this industry for a long time as a realtor. I'm a, a property uh, owner and manager myself. And um, certainly, uh, one thing that the housing provider almost uniformly is going to want is an opportunity to meet with the prospective tenant at the property to go over what the terms are. Because while you might have a written contract that lays out the terms, there's nothing like standing there and having an understanding of the actual property being rented. And I would say there are very, very few tenants that want to rent uh, property, certainly as living uh, quarters, uh, without seeing it first. Um, and in fact, uh, when that does happen, I think that usually the property uh, provider is skeptical of the situation. Because it doesn't make a lot of sense that someone would want to rent a property without seeing it first. But the idea that somehow we have a problem where housing providers are not providing access to units uh, and still uh, expecting the uh, tenant to be able to uh, engage into a contract and offer a security deposit and first month's rent, et cetera. Um, I just don't think that's a problem because I don't think it happens very often. I will tell you that there is a problem related to this that we ought to address. And that is that there are unscrupulous people in this world that use real estate listings to scam people. They'll take and copy a rental listing, take the images and all, and make a mirrored listing, usually for a very low amount of rent, and then they will advertise it. And they'll even accept inquiries and attempt to meet people at the residence, not let them in, of course, because they don't own it, um, and try and collect money from them for an application or something without even letting them in the property. Sometimes people collect fees online without ever letting folks uh, see the property, again, because they don't own it. If we wanted to do something to help tenant applicants from being robbed and scammed, not to mention the legitimate property owner from having to deal with um, confusion and drama associated with the listing and rental of their property, we could actually do something about that. We should make it a very significant crime to pretend to be the owner of a property for the purpose of running a fraud or a scam on prospective tenants. And I hope that uh, the folks in the room are listening because I, I plan on putting a bill in for that next year and I hope we, we address that issue because it needs to be done. It is so widespread and prevalent that it's actually hard to believe. In fact, almost every rental listing that I take part in, it happens. Numerous scammers put that information out there and attempt to scam people out of their money using uh, a basically a copycat uh, counterfeit listing. 
And it's amazing to me that we don't have the ability to enforce uh, our laws and crack down on fraud like that. What this uh, section of the bill hopes to do, however, is to uh, require the landlord to offer such tenant the opportunity to conduct a walkthrough. Again, I don't think that's an issue. It's a no-brainer. I think it happens already. I don't know that we even need to put that in, in the law. I will say that there have been situations, um, usually in a sale, not in a, in a rental, where uh, someone hires a uh, real estate professional to uh, look at property for them and arrange for uh, occupancy or a purchase. Uh, I've worked for uh, clients who are from out of state uh, for the purchase of investment property. And after a period of time and working with them on many deals, they, they come to trust you and they will say, hey, Rob, go out and look at this you know, two-family house in Bristol and let me know what you think. And I'll go out there and I'll give them my, my best um, you know, information about what I saw and they might tell me to go ahead and make an offer on their behalf and put a deal together. And that, that can exist. There is an element of trust that exists in business when people actually do work with each other and create that relationship. And uh, interfering with that relationship to me is somewhat of a problem. But in the case of a rental, I don't think I've ever seen a situation where a landlord said, no, you cannot see the property. The only situation I know about that uh, is those scam situations I just mentioned. And I wonder if some of the folks that have approached our committee or testified at our hearings were actually subject to those scams. Then they were not actually communicating with the legitimate property owner. They were communicating with someone who was simply trying to rob them of a application fee for a property they don't even own. So I'm just putting that out there. I guess what I would say about this is the section um, starting on line 62 through 67, which is subsection C, that says not later than December 1st, 2023. So uh, this December, the Commissioner of Housing shall prepare a standardized pre occupancy walkthrough checklist. Through you, Madam President, will such a standardized pre occupancy walkthrough checklist, by virtue of it being standardized, will there be uh, any opportunity for modification of this document through you, Madam President? Senator Moore. Through you, Madam President, I don't see anything in here that says there's an opportunity for modification. Through you. Yeah, Senator, thank you. Yeah, Senator thank you. Thank <laughs> you. We're all, we're in such a hurry tonight. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you to the Chairman. Um, I appreciate the answer. That's a problem. That's a problem. Because let me tell you, there is no such thing as a standard situation. There just isn't. When you are a tenant or a property owner engaging in leasing a property, there are no standard situations. There just isn't. There's always something. You know, where does the, is the, is the property furnished or unfurnished? What is the responsibility of the tenant with regard to a certain piece of furniture? I know someone who ha rents out a property that has a pool table in it. And they would really like to include in the lease that there's a responsibility to maintain that pool table. What if there are different circumstances about the responsibility for uh, keeping up the grounds or picking up leaves? or mowing the lawn or taking care of the sidewalk. Uh, through you, Madam President, is it uh, conceived that at least those more common but certainly different in every case situations uh, will be contemplated by the standardized form? Through you. Senator Moore. Through you, Madam uh, President. It's not mandatory. I don't see anything specific uh, in the creation of it. Through you. Senator Sampson. Thank you very much, Madam President. I am looking on line 46, where it says, shall use a copy of the pre-occupancy walkthrough checklist prepared by the Commissioner of Housing under subsection C, which is the one that I'm referring to. That seems very mandatory and not optional to me. Can we clarify through you, Madam President? Thank you, Senator Moore.
Thank you. Through you, it's, as I read it, it's mandatory that they create one. Through you. Senator Sampson. Well, thank you, Madam President. Once again, section, subsection C is about the creation of the form, and there is indeed a mandate on the Commissioner of Housing. I don't know whether the Commissioner of Housing even wants to take up such this chore, but if we pass this bill, they're going to have to, uh, because it does indeed say, shall prepare a standardized pre occupancy walkthrough checklist for any landlord and tenant to use, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing in there is optional. They're going to make that form. I agree with you there. But I also see in subsection baby A, it says after January 1st, 2024, upon or after entry into a rental agreement, but prior to the tenant's occupancy of a dwelling unit, a landlord shall offer such tenant the opportunity to conduct a walkthrough. We just talked about that of the dwelling unit. If the tenant requests such a walkthrough, the landlord and tenant their, or their designees shall use a copy of the pre-occupancy walkthrough checklist prepared by the Commissioner of Housing under subsection C we just mentioned. So they are required, mandated, no option, they have to do it. And I'd just like to confirm that we are at least in agreement about the language of the bill through you, Madam President. Senator Moore. Through you, Madam, we are in agreement, sir. Senator Sampson. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President, and thank the Chairman for that answer. I'm glad that we have uh, figured out what the bill says. It is indeed a mandate. And as I said, um, I think it's a problem because we've already heard that this form cannot be modified. And yet, it is clear to anyone who's using common sense that no two situations are alike. I have some uh, uh, situations that I'm aware of where I have clients, who tenants or landlords, that ask me all kinds of things about where to park the cars. They might put it in the lease, whether they allow political signs on the lawn whether the responsibility of the tenant to um, clean a drain that's in the middle of the driveway. You could come up with a thousand of these things. No two situations are the same. Every situation is different. Every lease is different. The circumstances and responsibilities for both the parties change every time because no two properties are really the same. And no two situations are the same. You have houses, you have uh, apartments, you have parking spaces, you have garages, you have appliances, you have no appliances, you have a furnished place, you have a non-furnished place, you have responsibility for yard, you have responsibility for lawn, you have laundry, you don't have laundry, I could go on. And we heard just now that there's no opportunity to change the form and the form's gonna be mandatory. This will create problems. In an effort to try and resolve that problem, I have drafted an amendment. Not surprising, I'm sure, Madam President. This one is LCO 9915. And I ask the clerk to please call this amendment, and I be given leave of the chamber to summarize. Mr. Clerk. LCO number 9915, Senator Member G. Senator Sampson. Thank you, Madam President. Very simple amendment. Rather than mandate the Commissioner of Housing to create a form, which I don't know that they really want to, and a form that doesn't leave any options for the many different possible uh, differences in situations, and then mandate the landlord and the tenant both to that situation. And the one other thing I didn't mention is that it also says that the landlord can no longer seek um, uh, damages out of the security deposit for an item that's not on the checklist. So if you can't change the checklist, then how do they actually address that situation? They can't. This is extremely problematic. I am imploring the majority to recognize that even though this is the last night of session, and I know that there's some desire to get as many bills done today and get out of here, I totally get that. But we cannot pass laws that don't work. We have a responsibility to the people that we represent. This section does not work. It will fail. It cannot possibly work in the real world. The amendment turns this section simply into a study. It says the Commissioner of Housing, and I apologize in advance if this amendment is 
adopted to the commissioner for requiring even this of them. I'm sure they're busy and they have more important things to do. But this says the commissioner shall conduct a study of a possible uniform preoccupancy walkthrough checklist. I'm not against the idea of a checklist. In fact, many, many landlords and tenants use them on their own. In fact, best practices is typically to take pictures, both parties, or record a short video walking through the property. When I have tenants rent my properties, that's what I do. The very day that I meet them, I walk through the property, we do a little short video, everybody knows what's there, we know if there's any marks on the floor or on the walls, they know. You can't put all of that in a checklist. So the checklist has to be able to be modified. And we need to give the commissioner the opportunity to be able to draft something that actually makes sense. So uh, I move adoption of this amendment, Madam President, and again, I urge a roll call vote. This is a very simple question. Do an unworkable uh, checklist or common sense? Let's do a study and figure out how to do it properly. Thank you. The question is on adoption. We will have a roll call vote. Will you remark on the amendment, Senator Moore? I will. Uh, thank you through you, Madam President. You know, the tenant has the ability to say they don't want to do the walkthrough. Uh, checklist and we just heard earlier that maybe the Department of Housing doesn't have capacity to do this I think a study would be burdensome and I reject the amendment thank you thank you will you remark further on the amendment before the chamber will you remark further if not a roll call vote has been requested mr. clerk would you let the senators know. Immediate roll call vote has been ordered in the Senate. Immediate roll call vote has been ordered in the Senate. We're voting on Senate Amendment G, LCO number 9915, Senate Bill number 998. This is an act establishing a tax abatement for certain conservation easements. An immediate roll call vote has been ordered in the Senate. We're voting on the amendment. This is Senate Amendment G, LCO number 9915, to Senate Bill number 998. An immediate roll call vote has been ordered in the Senate. all the senators voted the machine is locked mr. clerk would you let us know the tally Senate amendment G 
Senate Bill 998, total number of voting 36, total voting 8, 12, total voting 8, 24, absent not voting 0. Amendment fails. Senator Sampson. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Can't say that I'm surprised, um, but again, disappointed when I think I offer excellent amendments sometimes that really have strong arguments behind them. I was just joking with some of my colleagues. I said I may not win the vote, but I think I often win the argument, and I think I did in that case. The situation is very straightforward. You have a, a, um, a, 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 a tending, uh, walk through screening document. I forgot what it's called, forgive me. I'm moving on to tenant screening reports and it has baffled me. Standardized preoccupancy walk through checklist. And I've already made the argument that uh, there's no such thing as a standard situation and we simply cannot go forward with this bill, with this policy in it, for the very ex uh, express reason that what's going to happen is we are going to be putting the people that we represent, both the landlord and the tenant, at a disadvantage because they will be left with a standardized form. And uh, there's not a standardized situation. But I will move on to the, um, the next section, which is section 504. I think 503 is simply conforming changes. So we'll go to 504, which is the next uh, section that has uh, significant policy uh, information in it. And what this section appears to do is regulate the charges for tenant screening fees. And I find this um, an interesting policy. And I would say that uh, I am pleased that it is improved from the policy that was before us in the committee, which was entirely unworkable. It would have put a landlord in a situation of providing something they don't have access to. And it's, it would have also said that the landlord must provide a report before they've even um, collected the fee or accepted or denied the person for the unit. I don't know how you get paid in a situation like that. So I'm very pleased that that has been addressed. But this still remains a troubling section of the bill. And that is because, first and foremost, we are establishing in subsection little c again, uh, 140 through 144, it says a landlord may charge a fee not exceeding $50. And then it goes on to say plus an adjustment reflecting any increase in the consumer price index. Through you, Madam President, does the good chairman know what the current average price of a tenant screening report is in Connecticut through you? Senator Moore. Through you, Madam President. Uh, based on some of the testimony I heard, I, I heard around $75, if I'm correct. Uh, I don't know what the standard is for that. Senator Sampson. Well, thank you very much, Madam President. There is no standard fee. I mean, in order for there to be a standard fee, we would be um, dangerously engaging in some antitrust issues, which we don't want to. Uh, the state of Connecticut can do that, though. The state of Connecticut can establish a maximum fee, and that's what's here. But my experience is that the fee is around $35. Uh, in fact, the most prominent background check uh, company that is used in the state is Tenant Tracks, tenantracks.com, and the fee that they charge is $35 per applicant. So my fear about this section, more than anything else, is that by making the ceiling $50 uh, for a, a background check, you are creating a new floor for the fee. And if this bill passes, it would not surprise me in the least if the price goes from $35 to $50. And in the future, because we have CPI attached to this, it may go up exponentially from there. In fact, I think if we had passed this last year, we'd already be up to 55 or even beyond dollars. Is this what we really want to be doing? I don't think that there are too many landlords charging $75 with respect to the chairman. And those that are, I think that they are uh, limiting the ability of getting good tenants for their units. Um, and that's how a market works. Not to revisit the whole notion of government control versus freedom and competition, but effectively, if you are charging more rent for a similar unit than 
another landlord, guess what? You're going to get the tenant first. And if you're charging more for your application fee, you are going to be turning away potential tenants and therefore potentially good tenants. It doesn't make sense. And even though there is a lot of government um, interference and regulation in this industry, there's still a competitive marketplace, thank God. But more and more, especially as we go through this bill, and we're only on the fourth section of the amendment out of 40, we're adding more regulation and less freedom and choice for people. And this section I am very concerned with because I do believe that the floor of $50, or the ceiling rather, of $50 will become the new floor. And background checks will almost immediately revert from being $35 or $40 to being $50 plus CPI forever. That's not a benefit to the tenants. Just moving on. Section D talks about how the uh, landlord that charges a fee for the report shall provide the prospective tenant with a copy of the tenant screening report. And we did hear testimony during the committee that very often the uh, property owner is forbidden from sharing that report. They can look at it, but they don't have the ability to print it or save it or share it with anyone on purpose. Uh, all in an interest of protecting the identity of the prospective tenant. So it's very difficult uh, to meet that requirement. So I am pleased that we did include some language in here that says, or if the landlord is prohibited from pro providing such a copy, information concerning such report that would allow such tenant to request a copy of such report from the service provider that produced such report, and, and this is the part that made me uh, pause, it says, and a copy of the receipt or invoice from the entity conducting the tenant screening report. Can I ask through you, Madam President, what business it is of the um, tenant where the um, report uh, came from or uh, the amount that the housing provider actually paid for it? You've already established in the previous section that they, the housing provider is allowed to charge $50 plus CPI. So now why is it they have to provide a receipt through you? Thank you, Senator Moore. Through you, Madam President, it is to ensure that they really, truly did do the uh, screening. Through you, Madam President. Senator Sampson. Well, thank you very much, uh, Madam President. I appreciate that answer, and I can see the logic behind that, although I don't know that simply showing a receipt is a guarantee that that report was for them, that's prospective tenant, or that it proves that the report was done at all. Let me just ask one more question to, to, um, uh, for clarification purpose, which is that um, regarding these, uh, the section 504 and subsection C and D, uh, is it understood that, that a housing provider can charge this fee a maximum of $50 plus CPI for each prospective tenant that is looking to rent the uh, unit through you? Thank you, Senator Moore. Through you, Madam President, it says they may charge um, the fee, uh, not exceeding $50, so it doesn't have to be $50. And I would, I, because it's for every, every screening report, it's an individual. Through you. Senator Sampson. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I appreciate that answer. And I'm, and I'm pleased that it is indeed for an individual. And I, I do recognize that it does say a landlord may charge a fee of not exceeding $50, but as I mentioned, what, that uh, is an, a direct encouragement to charge $50. That's the way I see it. And I'm afraid that's what will, way, the way it will be seen uh, by the uh, marketplace. The marketplace is going to say, now the state is going to interfere with my ability to charge for a um, screening report, my, my costs for doing so, and they're stipulating $50. So I'm going to charge $50. It's the same conversation we had during our debates uh, in the committee regarding rent controls. The fact of the matter is when you establish a certain maximum amount that someone could charge, you say you can only charge a 4% rate increase, you can be certain that every landlord will charge the 4%. And the reason for that is quite simple. It's because that housing provider cannot know the future. They cannot know whether or not the future is going to put them in a position where 4% is enough. 
So if they miss their chance to collect the additional 4% this year, and then suddenly next year they will have needed that money to get by because the cost of their uh, expenses has risen 8%, they will be behind. And that's what happens when the government interferes in private uh, contracts and commerce between free citizens. And I'll say again what I've said so many times. Our job is to protect the rights of our constituents. And in this case, it's the rights of our constituents to engage in the free exchange of goods and services with each other. When we write laws of this, like this, we are interrupting the free exchange between those parties. You're telling them they are not free to make their own deal. Now, I understand it's being done out of some notion that we're protecting one side of the transaction. That's wrong also. We're not in the business of picking one side of a transaction to benefit. It's not what we're supposed to do here. We are sworn in our oath to protect the rights of everyone we represent. And what we should be doing is protecting their freedom to make their own agreement. That's what we should be doing. And I know that seems uh, to some folks, certainly in this chamber, as antiquated. But that's America. That's what made this country great and has given the quality of life that we all share. Is that freedom for people to engage in commerce of their own desire for their own benefit. Moving on. Section 505 prohibits a rental agreement from requiring a tenant to agree to pay a late charge on rent payments in excess of what Section 506 prescribes, and then Section 506 sets limits on late fees. Through you, Madam President, can I ask the Chairman to explain Section 505 and 506 to me? What is the period um, that a, uh, must happen before a tenant is late and can be charged a late fee? And are there limitations on late fees being established in sections 505 and 506? Senator Moore. If you, we could stand at ease for a moment, thank you. We will stand at ease. Madam Chair. Senator Moore. Thank you. Under existing statutes and, and case law, a landlord can charge the late fee only if they are authorized by the lease. Existing law also provides that the late charges cannot be imposed during the 10-day grace period for paying rent, and such charges can only start on the 11th day. None of this is changed by the bill. Through you. Thank you, Senator Moore. Senator Sampson. Thank you very much, Madam President. I appreciate that answer. Um, I noticed that uh, in lines 182 to 197, it says the grace, period, grace period means the nine day or four day time periods identified. Uh, can I just have an explanation on what that means with respect to the 10 day grace period you just mentioned through you? Senator Moore. Through you, Madam President. Uh, the nine days is I is through a monthly rental, and in the case of a one-week tenancy, uh, four days. Through you, Madam President. Senator Sampson. 
Uh, thank you, Madam President. So is the nine-day period the same as the 10-day period in current statute? Are we simply counting the day it's due plus nine days or something? I just want to know if there's a conflict where we're actually shortening the time frame uh, for a tenant's grace period through you. Senator Moore. Senator Moore. Through you, Madam President. According to the bill, it can't be charged until the 10th day. Senator, Through you. Thank you. Senator Sampson. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I don't mean to keep asking the same question, but does that mean that this language conforms with the current law? There's no change to the length of the grace period afforded to tenants with this bill? Through you. Senator Moore. Through you, Madam President. It conforms. Thank, thank you. you. Senator Sampson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. Okay, well, that's good news. I, at least we're not changing that period. I notice also in subsection of 506, little b, it says that the late charge may not exceed the lesser of $5 per day up to $50 or 5% of the delinquent rent payment, but the, it's the lesser of. So the maximum late charge would be $50. And uh, I believe that the current uh, law says 5%. Uh, is that correct through you, Madam President? Senator Moore. Madam, uh, through you, Madam President, um, I can't answer that. I don't have the answer to that, sir. Thank you, Senator Sampson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. I, um, I'm confident that the current law allows a landlord to charge up to 5%. Now, if we're talking about relatively low rents, we're talking about somebody who pays 1000 a month, uh, something like that, 5% uh, of uh, that would be, in fact, $50. But as we all know, rents are going up. And I don't know how many even $1,000 rents are available in Connecticut right this minute. Um, and in fact, there are many, many rents that are substantially more. And there are some people that pay unbelievable amounts for rent. You know, uh, there are some wealthy people that come to Connecticut and vacation on the shore. They may pay four, five, six, seven thousand dollars a month per rent. And that means that in a case of a late charge, the current maximum might be substantial. It might be hundreds of dollars. And rightfully so. If you're late on a payment that is substantial, five thousand dollars per month, that would be two hundred and fifty dollars, for example. So is it the intention of this bill to prevent um, people that uh, have rental property that can find a tenant at $5,000 a month and also tenants that can afford to pay a rent of $5,000 a month? Is this language intended to limit that uh, property owner from being able to collect an appropriate uh, late charge, I can tell you that finance charges would probably exceed that late charge through you. Senator Moore. Through you, Madam Chair. That is not the intent. Thank you, Senator Sampson. Thank you very much, Madam President. I appreciate the answer. It may not be the intent, but it is indeed the effect. So since that's not the intent, maybe I can ask the chairman if she can tell me what exactly hopes to be gained through this section. What is the purpose of sections 505 and 506? We already have a current policy in law that says you can charge up to 5% of the rent as a late charge based on a 10-day uh, grace period. It seems like this is a relatively modest change for most people, except when you start getting into wealthy people that have very expensive homes or pay very expensive rental payments. In which case, I think we're creating an unfair advantage for uh, the tenant in those cases um, because certainly, Somebody who can afford to pay a $5,000 a month uh, rent can certainly recognize that a uh, very minor 
fifty dollar I think ends up being one percent uh, at that point uh, late fee um, is not substantial enough through you thank you Senator Moore through you madam president uh, in, in the total context of it it says that you cannot access more than one late charge upon a delinquent rent payment regardless of how long the rent remains unpaid. So there is more than just the 5% and there's more than just the grace period in that section. Through you, Madam. Thank you, Senator Sampson. And thank you, Madam President. I appreciate that information, but I didn't ask about the additional information in the bill. I'm asking what the intent of this section is. Um, I'm gonna get to that final sentence, but I'm asking what, was, what is not working is maybe a better question. Why doesn't the current system work, the, sur the current maximum of 5% work so that we've uh, sought fit to insert this language in this bill, effectively altering lease agreements that exist out in the real world, which is my next question about what is the impact on that. But I really want to get to what is not working, why are we making this change through you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Moore. Through you, Madam President, if the rental agreement contains a valid written agreement to pay a late charge uh, in accordance to the subsection, then it is amended by this act on what, how much a landlord could uh, assess. I do want to say that based on some of the testimony that we heard, we heard people paying more than that 5%. That is the intent. It is t the intent is not to uh, people who are paying higher rents to uh, get additional funds for them, but it's to protect the person who may be paying $1,000 a month that, that it's not uh, piled on. And that also follows to the next part of it, that if they're delinquent in one month, that we're not piling on that one month that they're delinquent and building it, that they can never pull themselves out of this. Through you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Sampson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. I appreciate that answer, although all I heard was that people are not obeying the current law. Well, writing a new law doesn't fix that. It's another thing we do in this place all the time. We're always here trying to fix it. We'll write a new law, and the world will be perfect after we pass this. We passed a giant gun control law the other day. You think that's going to stop violence? I don't think so. We need to address the root causes of things. If there's criminal activity, we should prosecute criminals. We should do things to affect policy that changes the laws in ways that actually create a safe environment. And in this case, if people are not paying their late fee, or they're rather, excuse me, if they're, not, they're being charged more than what the law says right now, well then that shouldn't be enforceable. Do we have any examples documented through you, Madam President, of someone who was charged more than their 5% late fee and that was upheld by a court through you? Senator Moore. Through you, Madam President, I didn't bring any examples with me. Uh, I apologize, but there might be some testimony that we could look at uh, to see if there was testimony on that. Through you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Sampson. Thank you, Madam President. I, and I'm very sorry to be so persistent on some of these things, but I, let me just follow up and say, is it the belief of the chairman that if there was a uh, tenant that was charged, say double, they have a $1,000 a month rent, they're supposed to have a maximum $50 late fee, they were charged a $100 late fee. If they uh, challenge that, would the um, court uphold that and award the uh, landlord the additional $50 in excess of the sta statute? Is that her understanding through you? Through you. Uh, through you, Madam President. I, that's speculation, sir. I could not answer that. Thank you. Senator Sampson. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, and, I, and I appreciate that, except that I'm not the one who suggested that people were being overcharged their late fees. That was speculation. That was your testimony. You suggested that people are being overcharged their late fees, and that's what this section is for. But we already said that this section doesn't address that. This section creates a new set of circumstances and a new law that says that the limit is now not just 5%, it's $50. And there are plenty. We could go look at the uh, advertisements on Zillow or Truly or one of those sites right now 
for a rental property down by the beach. And I can guarantee you, you're going to find some of those properties that rent for multiple thousands every month. Was there any consideration of those very expensive properties owned by wealthy people and also rented primarily by wealthy people before limiting this late charge to $50 as a maximum through you, Madam President? Senator Moore. Through you, Madam President. This uh, is based on testimony of what we heard during public hearings. I don't, I can't tell you if the, the wealth of the people who gave testimony. Through you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Sampson. Thank you, Madam President. I'm going to move on to a, a different question in a moment, but I just want to pause by saying, you know, this is not an easy job up here. I, I don't relish the idea that I have to ask difficult questions of my colleague. I'm not enjoying the fact that I'm putting her on the spot and asking her difficult things. But the fact of the matter is, we're making laws here. We are making laws that the people outside the building have to follow. This is not just an exercise for what we're doing in this room. We're not just sitting here drafting ideas that might be good or I'm not sure or that could happen. This is a real law that we're talking about. And it will have real world consequences. And people that are out there are going to have to live with the consequences of our actions. It's wrong to make laws without thinking through and considering the consequences. And my opinion is this section does not consider the consequences. We have a perfectly workable statute right now that sets a 5% maximum late charge. Personally, that belongs in the agreement made between the tenant and the landlord and should be negotiated by them. But since we have an existing law, we should figure out whether there's something wrong with the existing law before we're here changing it. And I didn't hear anything wrong with the existing law. I heard maybe speculation. There are some people that are not following the existing law. In that situation, you find a way to correct that issue. You don't come back here and make a more onerous requirement on the citizens that we represent. The final sentence of this section says, the landlord may not assess more than one late charge upon a delinquent rent payment, regardless of how long the rent remains unpaid. And I read that to mean that if you are late for July's payment, $50, and that's always $50 late for July. But if you pay August on time, you're fine. You pay September on time, you're fine. But you still owe that $50 from back in July. Am I correct in that through you, Madam President? Senator Moore. Through you, Madam President, you are correct. Senator Sampson. Thank you, Madam President. Does that mean that if the person doesn't pay their late charge in July of $50, when they make their August payment to get caught up, the um, property owner cannot charge an additional late fee because they're still late for $50 from the prior month through you? Senator Moore. Through you, Madam President, on that specific month, yes. Senator Sampson. And thank you, Madam President. Do we know of any other person who is owed money in any industry, whether it's a car payment, a credit card, a mortgage loan, a personal loan, anything, Discover card? where people are not responsible for late fees upon the late fees that they fail to pay through you, Madam President? Senator Sampson, I mean, uh, Senator Moore, apologies. <laughs> through you, Madam President, I haven't done that investigation. I do not know. Thank you, Senator Sampson. Thank you again, uh, Madam President, and I appreciate the answer. But again, we don't have the information. I'm not aware. I don't know of another industry that says to the person owed the money that you are not allowed to assess late charges based on the terms that you agreed to with the borrower. Instead, the state comes along and says, no, we are going to take one side of this transaction and we are going to limit the other side in their ability to be properly compensated. Just imagine for a moment if the people in the majority here that are passing this law were on the side of the property owner and not on the side of the tenant. 
Because clearly they're on the side of the tenant. Each one of these provisions, as we go through them, it's clear they are taking a side in this transaction. And I started by saying, I don't take sides. I am here to find um, nothing but fairness, equal protection. That's what I'm after, equal protection. Nobody should get a benefit in any of these transactions. They should apply to all parties equally. No one should be getting an advantage over the other party, and certainly not through the power of the state government. But imagine for just a quick minute if it was reversed and the majority was on the side of the uh, landlord. They would be saying that you have to move out of the unit for a certain period of days per month because you didn't pay your rent. That's the same thing. That's kind of the same exact situation, and that's ridiculous. And everyone can see that. And this limitation that really is only going to affect wealthy people, there's going to be no a discernible benefit from people that are um, you know, um, average um, you know, citizens of Connecticut who are paying modest rents, 1000 or 2000 a month or whatever, somewhere in there, those people are probably not going to see any discernible difference in this policy. But the folks that are, are people that are renting to wealthy people who can afford to pay that late fee and should be held to that standard. Reading through lines 196 through 198 again, the landlord may not assess more than one late charge upon a delinquent rent payment regardless of how long the rent remains unpaid. For you, Madam President, is this a mechanism that might prevent the uh, landlord from, uh, uh, via the terms of the rental agreement signed by both parties, from being able to um, um, find the uh, tenant uh, in breach of that contract and to be able to um, begin an eviction process through you, Madam President? Senator Moore. Through you, Madam President, I believe line 188 says if there's a rental agreement contains a val valid written agreement to pay a late charge, they do, and they still have to follow the agreement of the, the lease. Senator Sampson. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Forgive me, I, I was busy conferring with a, a colleague and I missed the answer to the question. I, I, mean, I regret uh, doing so. Uh, can I ask the good chairman if she would repeat that answer through you, Madam President? Senator Moore. I said if there's a rental, through you, Madam President, I apologize. If, there, if there's a rental agreement that contains a valid written agreement to pay as a late charge in accordance with, their, with the subsection of this, that agreement takes precedent over this thank through you. you thank you senator sampson well thank you madam president i don't think that's accurate i don't think that the um language is written to say that the written agreement between the landlord and tenant would take precedent over this i wish it did that's the way it ought to work it ought to be the free uh, choice of both the parties in the transaction determining what the terms are this simply says that a rental agreement contains a valid agreement to pay in accordance with this language, then they can uh, assess a late fee. That's a bit different from saying that that supersedes it, so I will um, just make that correction on the record. But what I was asking is if this last sentence of this section um, removes a cause of action for a property owner to begin an eviction for non-payment of rent. It's a very straightforward question, and in fact, it's one that should have been contemplated long before we had this debate here in the circle today. Through you, Madam President. Senator Moore. Through you, Madam President. Could you please tell me what line you're looking at, sir? Senator Sampson. Thank you, Madam President. I am looking at the last sentence of subsection little b of 506, where it says the landlord may not assess more than one late charge upon a delinquent rent payment regardless of how long the rent remains unpaid. I am asking if this sentence would prevent the property owner from beginning an eviction process for non-payment of rent. 
Senator Moore. Uh, in my opinion, if the lease is entered on on the effective date of this, yes. Senator Sampson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. I appreciate that answer. I think it's a bit more complicated than what we're addressing right here because I think what's happening is that in normal circumstances, if a person is late on their rent for the July payment, for example, and they uh, pay it late, but they do not include the late fee, then unless they pay that late fee along with their August rent payment on time, they're still late and they can be assessed another late charge. This takes away from that and says they cannot charge them another late charge as long as the uh, August rent is paid on time. And that's neither here nor there. I think that's a one-sided policy, but it is what it is. But the greater concern I have is that if you continue along this process, you may at some point have a tenant that is not paying uh, late charges at all. So they're never honoring the agreement um, and whether or not uh, the landlord is able to use that as a means to suggest that the, uh, li the tenant is in breach of the contract. But I'm going to move on because I don't know that we're going to have a, a, an answer that we can rely on for that question, and I'd rather not establish some uh, incorrect um, uh, record uh, by our conversation. Let me just move on to Section 507. This section has to do with the Security Deposit Guarantee Program. Uh, and this is mostly existing law, but there are some changes here. Can the chairman please explain to me what is happening in section 507 through you, Madam President? Senator Moore. Could we stand at ease, please, Madam? We can stand at ease. Thank you, Madam President. Please proceed. Thank you. This change is, expands the eligibility so as not to be limited to tenants, the specific categories of tenants under the existing statute. In particular, it makes tenants eligible if their income is less than 60% 60, 60 of the state medium income. And that's about $60,000 for a four-person household. Through you, Madam President. Senator Sampson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. Uh, can the good chairman point to me the line in the uh, section where that limitation is applied and how that differs from the current statute? Through you. Senator uh, Moore. To you, Madam President, uh, beginning on line 208, any individual or family whose income is 60% or less of the medium income of the state adjusted for family size as determined by the United States of Housing and Urban Development. Through you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Sampson. Thank you, Madam President. I appreciate that answer. That was the first part of my question, which is where in the bill. But I also asked uh, how this differs from the current law. I'm curious to know if we're increasing the threshold for eligibility for the security deposit guarantee program or we're reducing it and if so and how much through you madam president thank you senator moore stand at ease please madam
Through you, Madam President, we are increasing it. The bill makes the security deposit guarantee program available to any person uh, or family whose income is less than 60%, so it's increasing the amount of uh, people that would be eligible. Through Sen you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Sampson. And thank you very much, Madam President. Yes, uh, my um, notes say that the current eligibility requirements are that they be recipients of the Temporary Family Assistance, or SAGA, uh, programs and are residing in emergency shelters or housing. So this is a substantial uh, change in eligibility. And I'm not uh, suggesting that's a bad thing. My concern is simply about whether or not we have the funding uh, for this program. Um, where does the funding for the Security Deposit Guarantee Program fund come from uh, through you, Madam President? Senator Moore. Uh, through you, Madam President, funding for specifically for what? Through you, uh, Madam President. Senator Sampson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Yeah, I, I'm concerned that this uh, program has money in it. Um, I don't know if the current program with the very limited uh, eligibility requirements uh, has a lot of excess funds, and that's the reason why we're doing this expansion, or the uh, budget that was passed yesterday incorporates funding for uh, the expansion of this program. I'm just looking to see if we're expanding the eligibility, how it's being paid for. Through you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Moore. Thank you, Madam President, through you. Uh, it makes changes, but it also say uh, it does, um, uh, Department of Housing already restricts the program and it stays within the budget of about 175,000 per year. Uh, and the amendment is not likely to result in additional costs associated with the new rules unless more funding is provided for the program. Through you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Moore. Senator Sampson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam President. I appreciate that. Um, I will just say, honestly, I have difficulty believing that this expansion will still fall within that realm of money. And um, I'm hopeful that it does. I would say that if that's the case, then the uh, state of Connecticut is doing better than I thought with regard to this program and the people that might be eligible for it. But it seems to me that the change is, is substantial. And I'm, I'm in favor of the change. I, I don't have any well, a reason to suggest it's not a positive direction to go in to capture more folks for the eligibility of the Security Deposit Guarantee Program, but I am genuinely concerned that the limited funds that are in that account are not going to be enough based on this change. And then what happens? I think that the people that were originally eligible that are truly the most in need, people living in shelters or uh, you know emergency shelters or emergency housing, I think they ought to get priority. Is there anything in the bill that gives those folks priority for this funding through you, Madam President? Senator Moore. Through you, Madam President, I apologize, I was distracted. If I could have the good Senator repeat the question. Senator Sampson. Thank you, Madam President. I was saying that I'm concerned there's not enough money in this program. I understand what I've been told and what's in the bill, but I don't believe that the expansion of the program um, will allow for everyone to be properly served. So I'm asking if there is a priority given to those who were initially eligible under current law, because those folks are people living in emergency shelters. Those are people in emergency housing. In my opinion, they should be given priority over folks that meet the new requirement of 60%. Through you, Madam President. Through you, Madam President. I don't see anything here that says there's priority, but I do say that the changes may result in more recipients receiving smaller guarantees and some participants receiving grants for one month's rent and other uh, benefits. And some of the changes are likely to reduce the average state cost to exceed the uh, year 23 appropriations in the same year. Through you, Madam President. Senator Sampson. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Madam President. I appreciate that information. I'm just reading the fiscal note, it says, uh, the amendment is not likely to result in additional costs associated with the new rules. And then it says, unless more funding is provided for the program. I mean, they're very upfront about the fact that they're going to use the money that's in the program. And of course, it's not going to cost more. But what is going to happen is the program is going to be exhausted way sooner. 
And I wonder if there was any consideration about that before making this change. Through Sen you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator. Senator Moore. Through you, Madam President. I don't sit on appropriations, but I believe that $800,000 was appropriated in the budget. Through you. Senator Sampson. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I hope that's the case. I hope that we did, in fact, properly fund that program. If we're going to be making a law that uh, is going to expand that program and create additional eligibility, good thing, then we've got to properly fund that program, too. Uh, and it would be wrong to limit the amount of funding to the old amount because it's going to be uh, exhausted very quickly. Uh, just moving on, um, Section 507 runs on for a few pages. Uh, but I want to get down to small g, which is on line 287, if you're following along. And it says, a landlord may submit a claim for damages. This has to do with a situation where a tenant damages the unit and uh, they are covered under the security deposit guarantee program, which coincidentally, I believe that the damages are also funded out of the same uh, fund, another concern that we have. Um, it says landlord, landlord may submit a claim for damages not later than, and it's being changed from 45 days after the date of termination to 20 days after the termination. I'm wondering what the reason for that change is. Through you, Madam President. Senator Moore. Through you, Madam President. If you recall, uh, we talked in here public hearings and during uh, discussions that there were people who needed their security deposit uh, sooner. Sometimes it's about domestic violence that they needed to get their money back earlier uh, to be able to pay their deposit on their next location. Through you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Sampson. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. This um, doesn't have a lot to do with that. This has to do with the time frame for which a landlord may make a claim from the fund for damages. Um, and it looks like it's limiting that time frame from 45 days to 20 days. And that's what I'm wondering is why that changed. Through you, Madam President. Senator Moore. To you, Madam President, uh, it does reduce the time, but it aligns with uh, and consistent with sections 536 and 537 of the bill, which requires landlords generally to account for the security deposit within 21 days of the vacancy. Through you. Thank you, Senator Sampson. Thank you very much, Madam President. I uh, fully intend on discussing sections 536 and 537 when we eventually get there or the clock strikes midnight, whichever happens first. But um, for now, I'm worried about this section right here. And my hope actually is to actually bring all these things back into alignment myself. Because I do believe that this situation is unfair to the landlord. Again, another policy being adopted and clearly one-sided and always moving in the same direction. Never trying to find a fair balance or freedom for the parties to choose, but rather an imposition by state government picking one side of a transaction um, and, and uh, using the force of government to apply it. And in this case, what's happening is you're limiting the ability of the property uh, owner to be able to determine the extent of damage and get estimates for such and be able to uh, submit an appropriate claim. 20 days is not very long. Is this 20 calendar days um, through you, Madam President, or is it 20 business days? Senator Moore. Through you, Madam President, it doesn't declare 20 calendar days or business days. Senator, through you. Senator Sampson. And thank you, Madam President. Well, the first thing I would say about that is we should. Again, I'll go back to what I've said 100 times tonight. We're making laws. And the people that are out there are going to need to know whether it's 20 calendar days or 20 business days. So when we write the law, we should tell them. We should make it clear so they don't have to wonder. But I'm going to assume that this is 20 calendar days because it doesn't say business days, and I imagine it would. But what happens very often is that when there is a uh, tenancy that ends and there is damage to an apartment unit, 
sometimes the landlord has to go out and get estimates for the damage. And I don't know if anybody who's listening or watching has had to hire a contractor any time in the last couple of years, but it's not so easy to necessarily get someone out there in a hurry. And that means that the landlord might have a difficult time being able to ascertain the true amount of damage and to be able to put in a claim. And in this case, I believe we're severely limiting that. 45 days, I think, was difficult enough for the landlord to be able to go ahead and comply with this section. And now we're turning it into 20 days, including weekends. That's, a, that's not a substantial amount of time. Uh, as a result, Madam President, I have an amendment. I'd like to, uh, to change this uh, time frame. Uh, the amendment is LCO 9848. And before we do that, sir, uh, Senator Duff has been um, seeking to be recognized. Thank Senator you, Madam Duff. President. Senator Duff. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, uh, would the clerk please again mark go Senate Bill 998, which I just marked as PT, mark it as now go, and would we please now call for an immediate roll call vote. Mr. Clerk, I will open the voting. Immediate roll call vote has been ordered in the Senate. The immediate roll call vote has been ordered in the Senate. This is Senate Bill number 998 as amended. An immediate roll call vote has been ordered in the Senate. This is Senate Bill number 998 as amended. An immediate roll call vote in the Senate on Senate Bill 998 as amended. An act establishing a tax abatement for certain conservation easements. An immediate roll call vote in the Senate.
of all the senators voted, the machine is locked. Mr. Clerk, would you please announce the tally? Senate Bill 998, as amended, total number voting 36, total voting yay 23, total voting nay 13, absent not voting zero. Legislation is passed. Miss and Senator Duff.